It was my grandmother who introduced me to the magic of cinema. A dream within a dream. Hop in. I came to Australia for a visit. Stay on. And I stayed for the rest of my life. I don't actually remember Australian film without David Stratton. They're kind of inseparable. David is so much a part of the Australian film culture. He loves cinema. My first experience of Australian cinema was The Overlanders. Good on you, mate. Good on you, digger. I didn't know it then, but it began a love affair with this country and its cinema. You know, you get to see our traits in our movies and remind ourselves that that's who we are. The greatest little country in the world, no risk. You white bastard. You black bastard. <laughs> We are a nation of storytellers. That's pretty goddamn special. Never let the truth get in the way of a good yarn. <laughs> These stories are more than stories. They do give us insight into ourselves, into our relationships. <laughs> You're terrible, Muriel. Can I drive? <laughs> a nation found its identity through cinema, and so did I. This is going straight to the pool room. This is my journey through the movies that made our nation. When I first came to Australia from England, I was a complete outsider. Like many before me, I was a stranger in a strange land. And I remember being overwhelmed by how different this epic country was at first sight. How do you know we're not walking around in circles? The stories of outsiders are an enduring theme of Australian cinema. And it's obvious why. We mean nothing in this massive landscape. We arrived on a ship 200 years ago. We've got shit Scottish skin. We're cooking here. Everything about this country isn't made for us. And out of that comes all these stories. Your turn to shout. Why I should shout. These are stories not only of strangers from other places coming to, surviving and adapting to an unknown land. He's trying to dance, right? They're also tales of the inner mental struggle we face to fit in and belong. I'm a beauty consultant. <laughs> this is a journey into how the stories and perspectives of so many outsiders in Australian cinema, both real and imagined, reveal so much about ourselves. Hello. Hello. Finding out where you belong is the theme of an iconic film partly shot in this church in 1994. A story of a nerdy outcast that Australia fell in love with. Like Muriel, I was also an outsider in my own family the black sheep who loved movies. I don't think any of the family would describe themselves as cinema lovers. I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't care less if I never saw another film in my life. Our father, who was very interested in sport, couldn't understand how anybody on a nice sunny day would want to go and sit in a cinema. My father expected me to become a businessman like him. I was heir to the family grocery company, but my passion was always cinema. When David started working at Stratton Sons and Me, he probably bunked off in the afternoons to go to the movies. There were rows over the supper table about his performance, and the position that our father took was, well, it'll never do you any good going to watch movies in the afternoon. My escape from the family business came in 1963. The £10 POM scheme offered cheap passage to Australia, 
provided you stayed for two years. Early on a winter's morning, the 29th of July, 1963, I got my first sight of Sydney. I was 23 years old, coming in through the heads at dawn, that was nothing quite like that. That was, that was really amazing. Like the lead character, Nino Colotta, in the 1966 comedy, They're a Weird Mob, I was a migrant to Australia. Although I spoke English, everything was foreign. In this place where strange people spoke strange lingo. Thank you, sir, but I, I wish to know where I, I am now. King's Bloody Cross. Where are you going? Uh, I have to go in King's Bloody Cross. Are you fair dinkum? No, I'm Italian. I think films resonate with people if, if they reflect their culture and they see themselves in it. And that's what their weird mob uh, did. And it came from a very successful novel. On the ship to Australia, I'd read the novel in preparation for my stay. But nothing prepared me for just how alien this new culture was. I had no idea how to order a beer. A schooner or a mini? How long have you been in Australia, mate? Or that swimming togs were known as dick stickers. Well, it's kind of a wonderful document of a particular time. There are bits of Australiana, there are bits of landscape, snippets of conversation, the way in which people interact. Right size, wrong colour. Your turn to shout. Why, why I should shout? There a Weird Mob was a British-Australian co-production. It was directed by the famous British filmmaker Michael Powell, responsible for classic films like The Red Shoes and Black Narcissus. At the time that There A Weird Mob was made in 1966, the Australian film industry was practically dead. Local films had thrived during the silent era, but the Australian film industry had declined due to economic depression, war, and a deluge of Hollywood movies. Because there'd been nothing happening for decades, generations of Australian actors lived and died without ever playing an Australian. By 1966, I'd just been appointed director of the Sydney Film Festival. I remember the anticipation of a new Australian film that ran through the industry, especially among the local actors who finally had a chance to be in a movie. The word was out that Michael Powell was coming to Australia to make a film. I had just got an agent and, like, everyone was just all a buzz and a flutter. That's it, thank you. I went in and there he was, and I was so anxious. Oh, Ginny, come quick, they're here, look. Ginny, I don't look across camera, I look under, under camera. You're supposed to be looking through the window. Anyway, I got the role. Where are your glasses, Ginny? Oh, I'll let them to Joe. Well, phone him, they haven't had a look at her either. Joe's cutting the grass for Edie. I'll phone him. Along with Jeannie Drynan, it was also Jackie Weaver's first film. And I had three scenes in it, two of which hit the cutting room floor, but one of them remained. And Michael Powell wrote me a letter back then when I was about 18, saying, I'm sure you're headed for great things. It's now framed on my desk. He didn't say it would take 50 years, but... <laughs> yeah, and I die. Just got in be both. I was one of the two million migrants who came to Australia between 1945 and 1965. This was the first film to deal with that seismic shift in Australian culture. How you going? Are you all right? All right, mate. It was kind of ahead of its time, really, talking about ideas that were almost impolite to talk about or to name. Um, and doing it with such, such great humour. The reason I connected to a film like There Are a Weird Mob was because it was about someone who was other, you know, who was, was different. And that's how I felt when I was a kid. Ah, 
I know it's only a film, but there's actually the grain of something in there which feels true. The way in which we feel about people coming to our country, um, that's the whole thing about their weird mob. Make your own Between then and now, little has changed. Each new wave of migrants endures suspicion. You know, all the Italian blokes were our mates and now we're taking the piss out of the Greeks, and then the Greeks became our mates and we're taking the piss out of the Lebanese guys. You know, but you were going to cop it one way or the other. I remember first seeing the weird mob and being really, really angry. <laughs> I just thought, oh, you know, this is just, um, you know, uh, poking fun at the wogs. The Vatican City, it's full of commerce. I have revisited it again, and there's a certain affection I have that is, there's so few visual records of that time. Italian cast as this wave of immigration that was going to blow white Australia apart was coming through. There you go, aren't you? I'm an Italian, sir. There you go. You have one on your wall in the place of honour. The Pope? If I'm a Dago, so is he. In the end, even Nino's toughest critics are won over. Nino and Kaya get married in September. And Nino finally understands what's needed to fit in. <laughs> Bring out the bloody beer! Nino fights for his place. He becomes mates with the guys, and he gets the girl too. Bloody good idea. The film industry had been excited by the production, but what surprised everyone was how audiences embraced the film. When it opened in December 1966, There A Weird Mob broke attendance records. Not just in its first week, but every week for 14 weeks. It proved Australians were hungry for Australian stories. I remember as a kid being mesmerised, seeing like these red tiled roof houses and backyards and people having barbecues. It hit me that you could tell a story literally about your own backyard. Audiences loved seeing themselves sent up on the big screen. And it's been that way ever since. Jesus, I feel like all my birthdays are coming at once. What a fantastic bunch of bastards. That's the future of dance sport. Dog in red. So many of our most popular films make fun of our peculiar cultural quirks. Hello. Uh, are you after a cup of sugar? <laughs> That's right. And cultures tens of thousands of years old aren't immune either. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away. <laughs> nah, not like that. I'm only joking. It had to have humour in it to truly reflect the culture. Heaven, <laughs> <laughs> this is filth. Red dog and red cat are Place your bets, gents. Australians are world champions of irony. How's the serenity? I grew up in a country town where the biggest man in town was called Tiny and almost everyone with red hair was called Bluey. Christ, were my underpants clean? Why do you ask? Well, like me old mum would have a stroke if she knew I passed out with skid marks on my wife runs. <coughs> Let's just have spaghetti. Cultural nuance is, is very, very important when it comes to comedy. Cash. There's no cash here. Here, there's no cash, all right? Cash, no. Robbo? No cash. They're quirky and all that, but they're never patronised. And we love them. I think I'm in love. Well, take it easy, mate. Last time you were in love, you got married. In Australian film, outsiders win our affections. We love them because they're us. Look at this sign up here. Stakes ahead. One of the first things I did soon after arriving here in 1963 was to take a road trip into the outback. It wasn't a sealed road then, it was, uh, it was a dirt road. I was looking for the Australia I'd seen in a movie as a child. <laughs> Keep on going, Phil. Don't let them check. Lead them right in. The Overlanders was a British-made film set in the Northern Territory during World War II. Australia was presented as a heroic place, 
in this true story of a monumental cattle drive across 1,600 miles of outback country. Plenty of other Australian films tell stories of white outsiders conquering the land. The man from Snowy River saw Jim prove his manhood by corralling all who run in the mountains. Even Baz Luhrmann's Australia celebrates the myth. His drover, played by Hugh Jackman, is a direct cinematic descendant from my childhood hero, Chips Rafferty. We'll have to take them over the top. You can't be serious. Yeah, we'll have them climbing ladders before we're through with them. Now, this should be interesting. So I went looking for this heroic place. But I found something much darker. In outback Australia, I didn't feel like a tourist. I felt a bit nervous. <laughs> that same sense of dread in an outback town is captured in a devastating masterpiece from 1971, Wake in Fright. It's the story of one man's descent into madness and savagery, brought on by booze and 48 hours of hell in a small outback town, where the locals are maniacal gamblers, and their favorite sport is shooting kangaroos. I just won't go down, John. Oh, yeah. Wake and fright. That's a tough watch. Wow. No one's going to live happily ever after in that film. So much of Australian film is about isolation and the consequences of it. It was Robert Hughes who once said that, you know, 200 and something years ago, they put a bunch of, you know, men on a boat, sent them to the furthest place on earth and dumped them there. Like They're a Weird Mob, Wake in Fright was directed by an outsider, a Canadian, Ted Kotcheff. They screened the film, somebody said to me, I gotta go home and have a shower. <laughs> I said, yes, that's what I want. I want you to feel the, the heat, the sweat, the loneliness, endless space. That space was damning. Coming from England, I really identified with the John Grant character, played so brilliantly by Gary Bond. But one of the most devastating things about the film for me was that Chips Rafferty, who was this great hero in The Overlanders, was playing this policeman who is so friendly and yet so quietly menacing. You're new to the ever? It's an incredible performance, and sadly, it was his last performance. You clever blacks never like to stop in the one spot long, do you? Depends on the place. <laughs> what about another beer? I think the whole thing with aggressive friendliness is very interesting. When I was traveling, the same sort of thing happened. Someone would shout you a beer, and you only wanted one, but you had to have another one, otherwise it was rude. Oh, thanks, I'll be running along there. He says, you know, let me buy you a drink, and the guy says no, and he puts his hand on his shoulder and says, let me buy you a drink, and it's terrifying. You know that bloke's gonna say, yeah, as many as you want to. My memorable moment with Chips was on the very first day in a pub. I said, action! <laughs> Spit it. What, 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 what is this, Ted? Cut! <laughs> he says, this isn't real beer. I said, be sensible, Chips. At this rate, by 10 o'clock in the morning, you'll be drunk. We'll have to send you home. He said, Ted, darling, you look after the directing, and I'll look after the drinking. Ted just captured with a fresh eye so many Australian things that we take for granted and don't see as extraordinary at all. Get up, get up. Ladies and gentlemen. That strange moment in the RSL, everybody stood and there was silence. I suddenly saw that moment as a ritual of a tribe 
And I was a member of that tribe. It was like watching a documentary about an Amazon tribe that hasn't been seen before. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Kochev cast a young Jack Thompson as one of the mates, the first of many Australian roles he would play. Ted was like a rocket. And those scenes when they're driving that car madly across the landscape, yahoo, head out the top. Ted Kochev is in that car. He's lying at our feet alongside the accelerator, yelling at us, encouraging us. So, go, go! It took an outsider to show Australians some ugly home truths. He brought a reality to the screen that was crucial for all Australians and all would-be filmmakers in this country to meet themselves for the first time. <laughs> And I know that people left the screening saying, no, 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 that's not us. That's not who we are. This is terrible. When Wake and Fright came out, the reviews were horrendous because there was an aspect of Australia that we didn't want to see because it was true. I'll get you. The way a culture exists today it can be traced back to its origins. With the first fleet rolling in, that violence that's just lurking below the surface. And sometimes it can be scary, and it makes for powerful characters. <laughs> he wakes up in the morning and he's had sex with his male friend, hasn't he? Mm. That was amazing. Mm. And it was subversive, progressive, and current. Mm. I remember seeing Wake and Fright and being terrified by that last 10 minutes. It was very disturbing. I mean, it pressed, pressed a very bad button. Back in the early 80s, I wrote, few, if any, Australian films made since Wake and Fright have had the intelligence, the power, and the fearful beauty of this masterly film. 35 years later, I still think that's true. A very different film about outsiders in the outback appeared in 1988. Only this film was based on a true story, a story of a couple judged by society as religious freaks guilty of a terrible crime. Now for mommy. <laughs> Evil Angels, or A Cry in the Dark as it was called overseas, tells the true story of the disappearance of baby Azaria Chamberlain when her parents were on a camping holiday here at Uluru. The public persecution of Lindy Chamberlain for the death of her daughter, Azaria, a crime she did not commit, became the basis for a terrible miscarriage of justice. God, no, please, God, no. The dingo's got my baby! What? A dingo's got my baby became the headline of the decade. Lindy's eight-year fight to clear her name was chronicled by writer John Bryson. His book inspired a film that attracted one of Hollywood's biggest stars, Meryl Streep, to the leading role. I think everybody would have liked to have had a go at playing Lindy Chamberlain. But I think all of us sort of thought, well, the greatest actress in the world is going to play Lindy Chamberlain, so that's OK. OK, stop it there. It gets boring after this. Oh, I just yelled. It wasn't time to go and tell people. Has anybody got a torch? The dingo's got my boat. The dingo. They must think we come down the last bloody shower. Evil Angels exposes the bigotry and intolerance of many Australians. The Chamberlains were members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
Director Fred Skepsi was appalled by the public hysteria centering on the couple's religion. And he encouraged his editor, Jill Bilcock, to convey this. Fred Skepsi comes from a very strong religious background. So maybe he connected more to that feeling of being isolated too, and the total injustice of it. Okay, this is the Evil Angels press book. Fred Skepsi was determined to expose the truth of the Chamberlain story with this film. It was everybody, everywhere, from every walk of life and every different situation having an opinion, expressing it rather aggressively. You can't blame a dingo, a dumb animal who can't defend itself. Well, I can't believe how the dingo kind of taken the baby and it's never been found. <laughs> I wanted to show all of those groups the whole picture of what was actually against the Chamberlains. What about this stuff here about sacrificing the wilderness, the name? It's a, it's a pretty it's a weird name, isn't it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Now, I heard it means sacrifice in the bloody wilderness. Now, that's what, fair you reckon they, fair what, you reckon they took the kid up there to sacrifice him? Yeah. Yeah. Evil Angels is a masterpiece. Yeah. It's way of telling a story by fragmenting it into different groups, passing a sentence to another person, picking another dinner party. That style actually was a generation changer for storytelling. The National Museum of Australia holds a poignant collection that depicts this brutal chapter in Australian history. It includes Azaria Chamberlain's black dress, hand sewn by Lindy. On the one hand, you can see how beautifully it's been made, but on the other hand, you can also see why the public found it so strange. The kid was always dressed in black. And so was the bloody mother. She dressed it in black almost. Yeah, well, I heard a rumor that the kid was really bloody crazy. The Seventh-day Adventist religion wasn't something that mm. many people were familiar with, and so that element of the other mm -hmm. um, sure. played into the case in so many ways. And I think items like this, you know, help kind of reinforce that. Lindy and Michael Chamberlain served as consultants to the film. These are Lindy's home videos from the filming. Fred was very, very good with Lindy. He would bring her into the office and he managed to get extra material out of her. So that then ended up in the movie. I quite like that one. That's when she still had her hair. She was so beautiful, I wish she? I wish I'd seen her. <sighs> Extra details in films are what make great films. The film is a distressing insight into a family's private hell. What good is prayer? Anything God's good for at the moment has stopped me from cutting my throat because that's what I feel like doing. Sam, can we talk about Evil Angels? I mean, it must have been an incredibly challenging film to begin with, playing a real-life character. I mean, how did you approach that? It was a tough shoot for both Meryl and myself. We did feel a sense of responsibility to those real people. And we knew we were doing a film that wouldn't be particularly popular with a lot of Australians, because so many people had made up their minds. Won't be much longer now, sweetheart. <laughs> Sam Neill was phenomenal. When he was in a fetal position of anxiety, they had a, a psychological honesty. Alice Lynn Chamberlain, you have been found guilty of murder. There is only one sentence I can pass on you, which be imprisoned with hard labor for life. The story is a terrible indictment, not only of the public and the media, but also of our legal and police system, all wrapped up in the madness of this injustice. I 
I would say the film Evil Angels was absolutely crucial in changing attitudes. I think probably before the release of that film, I would think many, many, many people still believed that she was guilty. After that movie, letters that were written in about one in three would be an apology of people saying that I believed that you were guilty until I walked in there and then I couldn't believe that I had been duped the way I had. I thought I had enough brains to see through this. Many successful Australian films were created in the 1980s. The most searing and political of all of them is Evil Angels. And the winner is Fred Skippers. I was thrilled to see the film so well received critically. Meryl Streep was nominated for an Academy Award and she won Best Actress at Cannes. But the local box office was very disappointing. Perhaps for Australians, the mirror the film held up to our behaviour was too shameful and too raw to stomach. This landscape, so alien to me, and which gave the Chamberlain story such potency, holds a nightmarish power in our cinema. No wonder it's the backdrop to so many Australian horror films. Many of those horror films see the outsider in a hostile land in which they have no place. The genre relies on stories of people trying to stay alive in a malevolent and dangerous outback where anything can kill you. Well, I survived my first trip to the outback as a tourist, so I didn't get killed by John Jarrett or eaten by a crocodile or a giant feral pig. Many of these horror movies have been filmed in and around the Silverton pub, just outside Broken Hill. They play off the basic fear that the land is so dangerous, the improbable is possible. Can I get you a beer? Bit of film history around the old place? A lot of film history around yeah. here, yeah. It's good. Cheers. Cheers. But there is a different way to view the outback, as a place of intense beauty. It took yet another foreign director who revealed the wonder of our landscape to us. One of Britain's finest cinematographers, Nicholas Rogue, had fallen in love with the Australian outback in 1959 while working on a movie here. Haunted by the landscape, he was determined to come back and direct a film of his own. Walkabout, released in 1971, turned out to be his major contribution to Australian cinema. Starting with only a 14-page script, Rogue set out to capture every detail he found along the way. When he came to Australia to make Walkabout, he used the new, relatively new, lightweight cameras to create a, almost an improvised film. On the one hand, it is a realistic story, but on the other hand, there's a mysticism and a, a fantastic element to the film. Talk about a, an outsider's look on Australia, someone coming into our landscape and seeing it through a different lens, literally. It's got a, a majesty and a kind of epic beauty and a kind of grandeur to it. That must have sparked a lot of our cinematographers to say, my God, our country can look like this. In the film, two English school children are abandoned and wander lost in the desert. But they survive with the help of an Aboriginal boy on walkabout during his initiation into manhood. Ask him for water! 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 What follows is a mystical journey, destroying the cliché of the dead heart and seeing the outback 
as a place full of life. Why did you say we were the first white people he's ever seen? I was seven turning eight when we made the movie. At the time, I didn't think it was a particular blessing, but looking back on it now, I realize that it was. After casting his own son as the young boy, Rogue scoured the mission schools of Arnhem Land to cast the pivotal role of the film. There was this young guy that was spoken about that had a connection to the traditions of the Aboriginal world, but at the same time, was a firecracker and a wild and engaging and charismatic person in his own right. When he met David, the choice was very clear. A dancer and accomplished tracker, David Gulpalol, that 16-year-old Yolnu boy, spoke several languages. He would soon add English to his repertoire and become one of Australia's most iconic actors across the decades. Nice to meet you, Sue. Bye, Nev. <laughs> Nicholas Rogue had given Australia a star, an internationally award-winning actor whose screen qualities were unmistakable, all the way back in his first film, Walkabout. When Gopal rocked up in that film, you know, it just made me feel proud. It made me feel awesome about who I am and about Indigenous character and understanding the country. And a film that actually, probably one of the first films that actually recognised that you don't know anything about this place. And if you ask for help, you can get it. And that's kind of what was really empowering about that film. With David, there was a, definitely a sense of wonder because, you know, he was like a sort of Superman in that environment where we were at times very uncomfortable and challenged by it, and David was always at ease. I was 16 when we made Walkabout. I found the outback extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, it was a landscape that I hadn't seen ever anywhere. Um, the vastness of it, the colors, the brightness of it. To many, it's a state of mind. You can find that presence dominating and, and frightening, maybe. Um, I only found it just really amazing. I do remember seeing Walkabout not so long ago. Something in it that I'd sort of forgotten about was the sexual tension that came across between Jenny Agata and David. <laughs> I'll be all right in the morning. Nicholas Rogue illustrated the undercurrents of desire in a potent scene at a swimming hole. And Nick Rogue was quite clear from the very beginning that he really wanted that sequence to be naked. He was influenced by the abstract landscapes of an Australian painter, Sidney Nolan. Nick wanted it to be very much like Nolan's paintings, which he showed me. And they do have about them an, an absolute innocence. It has nothing more there except that someone is completely on their own in a most beautiful landscape. And the thing about Walkabout, and I think all of Nick Rogue's work, is that he has a tendency to film something that you're left actually slightly puzzled by. And then you see again and again, and it, you're always, there's always going to be questions there. Nick Rogue was doing completely different things. I mean, so many people that you meet in the film industry have reused some of the images and the ideas from that. Walkabout is a commentary on Western civilization. It's an enigmatic and emotional film. I always end up in tears, the way their paths come together and then diverge. It's gone. Walkabout premiered in Cannes, where the film garnered much attention. David Gulpilil was seen as an incredible new talent. What did you think of the big cities? I don't know. It's very big, you know? Good for visit. But I don't like to live there. But locally, the film failed. Indigenous culture and experience was not popular 
with Australian audiences. And you won't wipe out the tribal instincts and desires of a thousand years in one small life. It's my duty to try. In reality, since white invasion, the traditional owners of this land were treated as outsiders in their own country. And Australian films reflected that. Indigenous people in film and television have for many years been projected as these social problems, you know? And a lot of our films, you know, beautiful films about us are really depressing and, you know, tough. You're a stain on the celebration of life. You are an abomination in the eyes of God. Put out your hand. But Aboriginal life isn't all that, you know, actually, being Aboriginal is a fabulous thing to be because of the humour and the camaraderie. There's a great spirit within Aboriginal people. I should have known one of your Aborigine kind would be worth nothing. That's not true, Father. What? There's nothing I would rather be than to be an Aborigine and watch you take my precious land away. The movie musical Brand New Day appeared in 2009, written, directed and choreographed by an Indigenous team. It's the story of Willie, who's being forced to be something he's not. This fire looks lovely and warm. It's going to be a cold one tonight. Ooh. Come here, we're not going to eat you. Well, not yet, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> come here, come here, sit down. After meeting Uncle Tadpole, Willie begins a journey home to Broome and discovers the power of connecting with his culture. I feel like going back home right now while the mangoes are ripe. The film was based on an award-winning stage musical by composer Jimmy Chai. And all of you guys here have the talent. Believe in yourself because you're chosen to present this thing. He wrote the story and songs in 1990, aiming to change negative perceptions of Aboriginal people. A, a kind of seriousness had sort of developed around how we talk about the question of Indigenous Australia. And then suddenly this mad play from Broom arrives and it's incredibly celebratory and we kind of go, you know, maybe we can relax about this and we can just sort of have some fun as well. The play and the film really helped us do that. Adapting the multi-award-winning stage musical for the screen was a risky venture for director Rachel Perkins, whose previous films, One Night the Moon and Radiance, were much darker. The cast is a mix of exciting new talent and known A-listers, including Geoffrey Rush, who initially wasn't sure he'd fit. She said, well, what about the German priest? And I went, because he's a musical German priest, <laughs> I'm more than interested. Ernie Dingo was on board and going to work with an Indigenous writer and female Indigenous director. There was a real excitement in that period of opportunities. What are you doing under my woman? I didn't know she was your woman. What's that, eh? It's from the condom tree. Yeah, the thing about Brand New Day is that on the surface, it is this sort of absurd comedy road movie, but there's many layers to read into the film. No cool at all! Uh, uncle, Blackfellas die in JLA. One of the scenes that I like, actually, is the scene when the jail transforms and these men appear out of the walls with chains around their necks. Listen to the news, it's talking about the blues of our people. The reference there is to the way that Aboriginal people were rounded up across Australia um, and incarcerated, um, particularly in Western Australia. Men in their thousands were taken from across the state, put in neck chains, transported thousands of kilometres down to Rottnest Island where many, many, many of them died. Listen to the news, talking about the blues of our people and they throw the chains off their necks and they start so dancing in a ceremonial game. way. Is this the end? Is this the end of the people? 
it's about the importance of culture and that culture Ooh, can up, assist with up. your survival. Brand New Day really is, it's a rejection and it's a, like a reclamation of Aboriginality in a really defiant, funny way. I thought Rachel Perkins did a fabulous job and so did the cinema goers here and abroad. It was just a fantastic experience to go to Broome and really feel as though you were on the wave of a, a, a really long-term blossoming indigenous cinema. The vitality and pride that runs through Brand New Day also runs through other indigenous-made films appearing in the 21st century. It's been called the new black wave of filmmaking. These diverse films show new ways of seeing Aboriginality in this country. Critically and commercially successful, they also prove that the outsiders can no longer be marginalised. The same levellers of humour and music were the core of one of the most powerful Australian films about outsiders. Perhaps we should have flown. A film that showed us we had the potential to embrace difference and to redefine ourselves by it. I'll never forget seeing the adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, for the first time. It was so unexpected. Like this room, the Priscilla suite in Mario's Palace Hotel. Wow. Featured in a scene from the movie. Sugars. 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 Priscilla came from being young, closeted, in a bar with my first partner. And, you know, we were obviously a couple of gay kids and uh, they turned on us. I never forget that moment of realising of just being unable to fight back and feeling so vulnerable and so isolated in the middle of nowhere and I, we, we were under siege and we couldn't leave, they just kept picking on us. <laughs> the heart of Priscilla was born in that moment. Stephen Elliott's film exploits the tradition of Australian stories set on the road. But the journey is both physical and psychological. The film took queer culture out of the closet and plonked it right down in the middle of the Australian consciousness. It was a feel-good movie and it was a phobia smasher. Two drag queens and a transgender woman drive into the desert to fulfil a dream. Great. That's just what this country needs. A cock in a frock on a rock. Actually, it was precisely what the country needed. First, only gays and IV drug users were being killed by AIDS. The world was just coming down out of their AIDS crisis. Gay was, was meant AIDS. I mean, it was as simple as that, and you were all going to die. So how about it? Well, I suppose a fuck's now out of the question. But then this little bubble happened somewhere in Australia. Something went off, and I think it was very much Keating and Hawke. They just took this liberal attitude. It's almost like the entire country had gotten sick of being frightened. It was a time in our history, culturally, where attitudes towards what defines sexuality were really shifting. Priscilla's lead characters are vulnerable. The movie turned preconceptions into real people. Will you have a boyfriend when we get back to Sydney? Maybe. That's good. It's a mainstream film in many ways. It's a great celebration of all sorts of things. But it's uh, deep down 
it somehow speaks volumes about the big shift that was happening socially in this country. Priscilla is, of course, incredibly significant in terms of its embracing of transgender politics. Priscilla is very us. It is very Australian. We, we like, you know, it's Dame Edna. It's, we like a bit of a man in a frock. Madge, Barry, do you remember Madge's little girl, Gaylene? When you were toddlers, she used to play with you. Australian films revel in discomfort. There's an awkwardness about Australian masculinity and that seems to show up time and time again in movies. Priscilla was probably so loved because it was saying, well, these guys are male and yet they celebrate their lives in a very different way. This land, which had been mythologized as a stomping ground for frontiersmen, was now also a place for feather boas. The incongruity of drag queens in the desert showed us that identity is endless. Our films have the power to help us see things in a new way, to bring the outsiders in from the edge. And that was true for me too. I grew up in England, but now I've spent more than twice as much time here in Australia as I did in the land of my birth. And I'm no longer an outsider here. I'm now, I think, a part in some way of the Australian film industry. And I've made Australia my home. Next time, I'll journey into the stories of Australian films that show our home. Telling me, Dream. That depict our domestic lives in dangerous ways. Ah! Come on. The hidden stories of families and relationships. He never leaves it alone, you know. And the cultures and tribes that make us who we are. These are the stories of our people. Mm -hmm.